But she was a missionary for over 30 years in Poland, uh, behind the Iron Curtain. She and her husband went very young with a, with a, uh, a month-old baby and went to Poland. And her story is just amazing. Of course, they were like spies behind the Iron Curtain. She couldn't really tell any of her stories. And after uh, the Iron Curtain fell, she wrote a book, Stories from Behind the Iron Curtain. And so you do not want to miss her testimony. And I, I read her book, and I just had this thought. She had some Mississippi ties. And uh, I just thought, hmm, wonder, wonder if she might consider coming to Mississippi and being our speaker, because we don't really have a big honorarium written in our budget. We like for every penny of our money to go to Casa de Fe. And so I just had her email and I just took a chance and I emailed her. I told her all about Casa de Fe. <coughs> Excuse me. And how it began and who Patty Sue was. And I went all through it. And then at the very end I said, and we can only pay you this much. But hope you'll pray about it and come. And she emailed me back and said, we want to come. And she said, I feel like the Lord would have me say yes. So she is coming and I'm so excited. I can't wait for you to meet her. She's just precious. We're going to be doing our Tis the Season this year. We're going to do it as we did last year. We gave away, instead of doing our big auction, we just gave away door prizes. Very nice door prizes. And so this year, all in front of our speaker's table will be just beautiful door prizes. And um, I hope you all come. Uh, the, the price to get in is just an offering. You bring an offering. And we're going to take up money that night to give to Casa de Fe. And I'm real excited about it. Um, twice a year, they have to pay According to Ecuadorian law, their employees double. They have to do that twice a year. And they have to do that in the month of December. So we, our offering always helps provide to pay for that double pay. And they are the largest employer in the little city of Shell where they live. So they really depend on our banquet to help them the month of December. So, take that home with you if you go to another church. Bring a group of ladies that night. It's such a fun event. Our, our um, fellowship hall will be decorated beautifully, and you're going to be inspired when you hear stories from behind the Iron Curtain. Let me just tell you, you're going to be inspired. So, put that on your calendar and save the date. And now let's jump into our last lesson for our fall semester. And it's a perfect place. Chapter 8 is the perfect chapter for us to stop and take a break after it's just sort of the mountain peak of the book. So let's pray as we begin this morning. I'm so glad you're here. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pause now. We ask you to just help us to focus now this morning as we listen 
to your word being taught. I pray, Father, that this lesson would land on our hearts, that it would inspire us, that it would encourage us, that it would exhort us, that it would just get inside of us, Father, that we would understand it. Oh, how we love your beautiful word together. We love gathering every Thursday and, and meeting in our small groups and enjoying such rich fellowship centered around your beautiful word. It's such a, a, a wonderful opportunity to come and build the word of God into our hearts that we might be women on mission for you in this generation. This is our generation. This is the generation you've called us to serve you in. And Father, we need to know your word. We need to equip ourselves so that we might be better servants. So this morning, take your word and, and just equip us with it and speak very personally in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, as we were coming to the end of chapter 7, Jesus left Israel with his disciples he went for a tour with them through a Gentile region. They went first to Tyre, then they went up 20 miles or more to a little city called Sidon. Then they came back around all these Gentile region on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is completely opposite of where we have been in the region of Galilee. And they ended up in an area known as the Capitals. Decapolis is a region that has 10 cities in it. And as we ended chapter 7 last week, we found that the Gentiles were full of wonder at the person of Jesus. I mean, they were amazed. It says they were astonished beyond measure. I mean, Jesus came into their area and knock their socks off. They're, they're over the top. They're, they're floored by everything he did. And this is what they said about him as we closed chapter 7 last week. They said, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf hear and the mute speak. And it, if you go to Matthew, it says, and they gave praise to the God of Israel. So that is where Jesus is as we come into chapter 8 this morning. This tour that he was on probably lasted for several months and it included over 150 miles. Jesus is focusing on his disciples now and he's getting them ready to receive the Great Commission to go into all the world with the gospel. And that's going to include the Gentiles. And as we come to chapter 8, in the midst of a massive crowd, we find Jesus there by the Sea of Galilee. And he's healing them. And he's having compassion on the Gentiles. He's still in this Gentile area. Now, I want to say this. When you're studying your Bible, you have to think Jewish sometimes. And I want you to think Jewish with me. Let's get in a Jewish mindset. There's some things they didn't get. They didn't understand. The Jewish people had great animosity toward Gentiles. And to tell you the truth, you know what? Gentiles really didn't like them either. It was a mutual thing. But when Jesus comes, we see Jesus has a different heart toward the world. And he's modeling now his heart to the disciples. It's a heart that loves the world. And he's spending time and he's training and he's getting his disciples ready to step out of their Jewish mindset and to take the gospel into the world. Now let's go to our chapter and let's look at verse 1. Oh, by the way, I Forgot to tell you to get out your observation worksheet, so I hope you did. If not, turn to Mark chapter 8. Now go to verse 1. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, 
he called his disciples to him and he said to them, now I want you to notice what he said. I have compassion. I have compassion. Let's stop right there because that is a very interesting statement that Jesus makes right here in the very first verse. And this is the only place in the four Gospels where Jesus ever just states that I have compassion. I feel compassion. Now there are many references to his compassion, third person, for example, we read uh, through the other gospel writers, Jesus felt compassion. They're just making observation. Or they'll say Jesus had compassion. But here, this is the only place when it's in first person where Jesus just makes this declaration where I feel compassion. Let's write down some things about compassion. Compassion is actually an attribute of God. You're not going to find in the religions of the world any God out in the religions of the world who is by nature known as being compassionate. That is a distinctive attribute of the true and living God. He is compassionate. Now, what does that word mean? It means to suffer with. To suffer with. It means to feel along with. Compassion is behind what he is about to do here in chapter 8. Now, go back to our chapter and let's look at verse 2. He says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in, in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them. He gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Do you realize that Jesus is moved with compassion? even when somebody's just hungry. And notice, he is not just compassionate toward Israel here, but he's compassionate toward the Gentiles. These people have come a long way. These people have been there for three days. They've just been camping out. They can't leave because they have never seen anything like Jesus before. They are stunned as they watched him healing people and they're just so overwhelmed by what is going on that they put their hunger aside even though this is a desolate place. There is no food available. It's a barren area. And so the disciples, they come to Jesus. What are we going to do? That's the question that's in their mind. Now they don't doubt his power to feed. Why? Has he done it before? Yeah, remember? How many did he feed before? Well, it was like we said 25,000 people. 5,000 men and women and children. But here's the question that they're thinking in their mind. Now, we know Jesus can do it, but here's the question. Will he do it for the Gentiles? When he did it before, he was in the little town of Bethsaida, which is up in uh, the area of Galilee, which is Israel. He'll do it for the Gentiles. But these people, these people are, Gen these people, I mean, he'll do it for the Jews, but these people are Gentiles. They're outside the covenant. The Bible calls them strangers, aliens. But one thing for sure, 
The disciples can't do it. They don't have the resources to feed this group. It's beyond their capabilities, so they're just waiting. They're waiting to see what Jesus is going to say, and would he do it for the Gentiles? Now, let me tell you what Jesus is doing. He's teaching his disciples. He's teaching them that he loves the world. This is all a part of their curriculum as they're walking with him through this Gentile area. And they're going to learn that, yes, Jesus has compassion toward everyone, even toward the people that the disciples as Jews have been trained to despise. And Jesus asked them, how many loaves? How much do you have? And when you say loaves, now we're not talking about a big loaf of, um, you know, like we grab at the store. We're talking about a little loaf, which would be a biscuit. <laughs> A little bread cake is what it would be. And they said, oh, we have seven. Oh, and by the way, we have a few small fish too. And then the action begins. And they're holding their breath. And so he says, have everybody sit on the ground. He takes the bread and begins serving. And this is a sheer creation miracle. Bread and fish just start appearing out of his hand coming out of nowhere. They're appearing full grown, having never lived, having never died, and they're created edible, ready to eat. This is a creative miracle. And Matthew tells us he kept giving to his disciples and that the disciples kept giving to the crowd, giving to the crowd, again and again and again. And then down in verse eight, it says, and everyone was satisfied. Let's look at that word satisfied because it means everyone in the group got as much as they wanted. Everyone got as much as they wanted. It means they were totally filled. And once again, we have seven large baskets left over. Now that word for basket there means a large basket, like a chest or a hamper. So whatever was left over was used for the disciples, the apostles, and perhaps there were some others who were there that day helping serve the food beyond the 12 disciples. Now go back to verse nine. It says there that 4,000 were served, that 4,000 were there. If you go to Matthew 15, verse 38, you get a clarification. Let's go there on your handout and let's see what, what Matthew adds to our story. He says, all those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. Now I'm going to tell you this crowd was more like 15,000 people. This is just a massive miracle. It would take a lot of bread cakes and a lot of small fish to fill up people who have not eaten for three days. Now, what's the message here? Let's write it on our handout. The message that Jesus is teaching to his disciples is that salvation is for the Gentiles. Salvation is for the Gentiles. And here's another point. The compassion of God is not limited to Israel alone. This is a profound lesson. And then verse 9 says that Jesus sent the people away. It was over. The three days are now gone. He's done, and it's time to go back to Israel. Now look at verse 10. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Now Matthew calls it Magdala, same area. They're right by each other. And so this is the end of the tour through the Jew Gentile regions. And now Jesus is back in the region of Galilee. And all the while the disciples are learning very, very valuable lessons. And this brings us to our next section in our journey through chapter 8. Now Jesus is going to have another encounter with the religious elite of Israel. Let's look at it together in verse 11. Go with me there. The Pharisees came, and by the way, let me tell you this. Matthew also gives us the fact that the Sadducees were with them. So you've got the Pharisees, 
and the Sadducees, they're both the religious rulers in Israel. We'll talk more in a minute about them. And they began to argue with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation, and he left them. Now let's stop right there, and let me tell you something. And I want you to write it on your hand down. This is the last time the religious leaders will face Jesus in Galilee. So write that on your hand down. Because he's done with the leaders of Israel. And from this point on, his teaching, all of his powerful displays, they're not for the leaders of Israel. They are only going to be for those who believe. So write that on your handout as well. And from here on, everything that takes place is going to be directing, uh, driven directly at the disciples. So write that on your hand now. I want you to get this in your mind. They're going to be the focus now of both his miracle power and his instruction. And why is he doing it? Write it down. He's preparing them for future ministry. And we're approaching the, the, the high point in the whole book of Mark in this chapter. But let me say this. At this point, in his ministry, he has become publicly discredited at this very point in his ministry. Publicly discredited. He's been denounced by the leaders of Israel and all the people who follow those <coughs> leaders. They are following the leaders in that rejection. All they want to do is kill him. And for those who are following him, there's the apostles, and there's a, a small group of true believers. They understand now that if they follow Jesus, this is going to mean they are leaving their rabbis, they're leaving their priest, their chief priest, their high priest, they're leaving the Pharisees, they're leaving the scribes, and they're turning their back on apostate Judaism. And that's what it means. This Judaism had been their life. That's all they knew. Judaism is the word for your life. They are now full-heartedly going to be following Jesus. And they're separating themselves. They're separating. And Jesus has been discredited. He, he's been scorned. He's been blasphemed. They're coming to this firm conviction, the disciples are, that he is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. So they're back now into Jewish territory. These religious leaders come to argue. They're on the attack. They're seeking to discredit him even more and they just walk right up boldly to him and they start a fight and they say, give us a sign from heaven. We want a sign from heaven as a test. They really literally are looking for a miracle in the sky. Like, stop the sun. Turn the moon to blood. Bring fire down from heaven like Elijah. Change the constellations. They're doing this to tempt him. And Jesus says, no more signs. No more signs will be given. And the truth was they didn't need any more signs. They had had plenty. They had had enough. But perhaps they're thinking of the prophecies out of Joel chapter 2, where Joel is prophesying about the sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood and the stars falling out of the heavens. Because Joel did say this would happen when the Messiah returns. But this is just so ridiculous. Their own leader named Nicodemus, we know about him, don't we? 
Did you realize Nicodemus was a Pharisee? Look to what Nicodemus said on your handout out of the book of John. Nicodemus had already said, Rabbi, we know. When he says, we know, he's a Pharisee. We Pharisees know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. They didn't need any more signs. They had plenty of signs. But here's the deal, and I want you to write it down. They were hardened in unbelief. Hardened in unbelief. And verse 12 says Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit. Such an interesting expression. Let me tell you what it meant. It meant his heart is broken. His heart is broken. It's a deep expression of grief. He's just so sad over the hard-hearted unbelief in the face of such massive evidence. And then he says this, why does this generation seek a sign? I mean, what else can I do? Truly I say, no sign will be given to this generation. You just don't get it, do you? You don't recognize what season you're in. It's the time for salvation. Now Matthew 16 tells this same story. And um, he says this, look on your handout, verse 4. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. Interesting. And Matthew 12, 39 through 40, explains what the sign of Jonah is. And let's read that. He says, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now that's the only sign you're going to get. That's what he tells these leaders. And we're going to see that when that sign came, when Jesus was buried three days and rose after the third day, when the word of that got back to the religious leaders that he had risen from the dead, according to Matthew 28, you know, they had called the soldiers in who were guarding the tomb and they had bribed those soldiers when they told them that Jesus was resurrected they bribed them to lie about the resurrection. You see, they denied it even when they knew it happened. That's how hard-hearted their hearts were. They were set in darkness. And then verse 13 says, he left them. Now that was it. He gave them up. So tragic. And verse 13 says, got into a boat, again and went to the other side. Now, this is a monumental moment that the disciples have just witnessed. They're standing there as Jesus is having this interchange with these religious leaders. I mean, it's a big deal. You would have thought they would have gotten in the boat and said, my goodness, oh wow. Tell us more about what this means. I mean, uh -huh. What, what were y'all talking about? Explain it to us. But, but that's not what's on their minds. They get in the boat and, well, you know what they're thinking, don't you? What time is it? It's lunchtime. Yep. And they're men, and they are hungry. And it's lunchtime, and they're getting in there, bless their hearts, they're such knuckleheads. I mean, if the future of Christianity is depending on them, I'm not feeling too good about the plan right now. Go to verse 14. Now they, the disciples, had forgotten to bring bread. This isn't good. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Twelve men, one little bread cake. I mean, they are so preoccupied because it is lunchtime. But Jesus is wanting to teach them. And he cautioned them saying, this is verse 15, watch out, 
Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now let's just stop here for a minute and let me say something about the disciples. Let's just get in their skin. Let's feel what they're feeling. You see, Jesus is speaking to them about a very important issue. If they're going to sustain the strength of their commitment to him, they're turning their back on their whole way of life, on their society to follow him, and they need to be aware they are in danger. And he's warning them, watch out, beware. This is a very severe warning against the influence of the Pharisees and against the influence of Herod. And in Matthew, <laughs> be aware of the Sadducees too. You see, these were all very influential people in Judaism. Let's write down some things about them. The Pharisees, they were the legalist. The legalist. The Sadducees, they were the liberals. And the Herodians were the secularists. Pharisees legalists, Sadducees liberals, Herodians are the secularists. They hated each other, and yet they're all three coming together because they want to get rid of Jesus. And Jesus is warning his disciples, watch out, I'm warning you, now, this is something, listen to me, that is foundational for new believers to understand. Because new believers, they are just so vulnerable. They're so vulnerable. They're easily swayed. They're kind of in like jello. They haven't gotten concrete in their faith yet. And so write this on your handout. Leaven is a biblical illustration of permeation influence. An influence that permeates. It's leaven. It, another word for leaven would be yeast. It's like yeast. And you know how yeast will invade and spread through a lump of dough. And Jesus is saying, listen, you need to be warned. You are surrounded by legalistic, pharisaic religion you're surrounded by liberalism. You're surrounded by secularism. And they all have this invisible power to corrupt when you get exposed to them. And so Jesus is urging them, and write it on your handout, yeah. to make a full break with their old way of thinking. That's what he has in mind when he says, watch out for the leaven. Now, when we come to Christ, let me say this. It means I'm setting everything in my past aside, and I'm making a clean break with my old way of living, my old way of thinking, and yet are there influences out there that are very dangerous to me? There are. And Jesus is teaching them. He's telling them what they need to know and what they need to do and what they need to be aware of, what they need to run away from, and what they need to avoid. And go to verse 16 for their response. They could have asked, uh, well, how will I recognize the leaven? Uh, how do I know exactly what's influencing me? How do I exactly do it to avoid it? What should I do to insulate myself? They could have asked hundreds of questions. And they look at each other and they say, what are we going to have for lunch? <laughs> look at verse 16. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. They missed the entire message. Bless their hearts. And in the parallel passage out of Matthew 16, it tells us plainly they thought he was talking about actual bread. Don't eat bread that has leaven in it. But wait, we only have one little cake and it has leaven in it. We can't even eat that. When they heard that word leaven, they just went straight to lunchtime. And Jesus has such patience with them. Go to verse 17. 
And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Haven't you heard anything I've said? Come on, guys. Then he's going to ask them a bunch of rhetorical questions. Verse 17, Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Are you even listening to me? Do you not remember? I know your needs. Remember when I took five loaves and fed five uh, five thousand? And how many baskets were left over? And what did they say? Uh, Twelve. And don't you remember when uh, I had seven loaves and I fed four thousand? And how many baskets did you take up? And they said, uh, seven. Come on, guys. I just fed thousands and thousands of people. I didn't do it once. I did it twice. Have you forgotten what in the world are you thinking about? Why are you thinking about lunch? Why aren't you thinking about the things that are important? But he's so gentle with them. Look at verse 21. And he said to them, do you not understand? Well, I'm going to tell you they did understand because Matthew tells us they did. He adds a footnote in his parallel account. Look at it on your handout, verse 12, Matthew 16. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Bless the Lord. Oh, we get it now. Oh, silly us. You weren't talking about actual bread. You're talking about the Pharisees. Now, this is just a baby step for them, an intellectual baby step, but it's a step in the right direction. Finally, they've gotten off lunch and they've gotten on to the bigger issues. And Jesus is discipling them so very gently. Now, this brings us to our next section, which is a story of a miracle. We only find this miracle here in the Gospel of Mark. Mark actually gives us two miracles that are recorded in no other place. And one of the other one is in the uh, last week's lesson when he healed the deaf man. This miracle is coming at the very end of his ministry in Galilee. Now let's write some things down about it. It happens in the town of Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Bethsaida is the home of Peter. Andrew and Philip, three of the disciples. This is such a sad day for Galilee. He's been there now for a year and a half, and he's about to leave. Let's look at this story. Go to verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the man, the blind man, by the hand. And led him out of the village, and when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. He could see, but it was all out of focus. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Now this is an unusual miracle. It's different than the others. And it's because uh, Jesus healed in two steps. So write that on your handout. And it is also a very private miracle. I'm not sure what order I had that on your handout. So it's a private miracle healing in two steps. Now we can assume that the man did what he was told after Jesus said, go home. Don't go back to the village. Go home. Don't worry. News is going to spread very soon about this miracle. But I want you to remember, after this, no more miracles in God. And now we come to the mountain peak. In the book. Go to verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. 
Now, Bethsaida is at the very top of the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi is above it, north. Let's write some things down about it. It's 25 miles north of Bethsaida. <coughs> it is the last outpost in Galilee. And even though it is in the land of Israel, it is a city that's occupied by Gentiles. And so it feels more like a Gentile area. The disciples had been with Jesus now for two and a half years. I want you to get that in your mind. We are months away from the cross. Just a very few months. I mean, just think of all they have seen as they've been following him. They've seen Jesus feed thousands of people. In Bethsaida, in Decapolis, they've seen Jesus walking on the water. Uh, they've experienced that quantum leap from the middle of the sea to the shore. They've seen great healings on Gentiles and on Jews. Astounding, creative miracles, new eyes. New limbs for the main, resurrection from the dead, deliverance from demons. I mean, so much light has been flooding them because they are, in fact, walking with the light. And now it's time for their exam. And their exam has two questions. Here comes the first. Verse 27. And on the way... As they're leaving Bethsaida, they're heading to Caesarea Philippi, he asked a question. And here it is, the first one. Who do people say that I am? Now what was their question, their answer to that question? Look at it, and they told him. John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. So they knew he was very, very special. They knew he had to be a prophet from God, but we have to get in their skin and think Jewish. They were expecting Messiah to come and to be a military leader, to be a conqueror. They expected their Messiah to take their nation and make it the greatest nation on the face of the earth with all the other nations under it, and their Messiah would come and rule as the king in Jerusalem, and that's what they were thinking. That was the view that the Jews had for their Messiah. And so they say, some say you're a prophet from God. I mean, maybe you're John the Baptist resurrected. Maybe you're uh, maybe you're Elijah. And Matthew says, maybe you're Jeremiah. Now it's time for question two. Go back to the verse. And he asked them, here comes question number two, but who do you say that I am? Now that is the most important question you will ever answer. <coughs> that answer that you give to that question determines your eternity. And Peter answered him. And Peter's the spokesman for all the disciples, and so he's answering for the group. He says, you are the Christ. Now, this is the first time this confession has been made in the Gospel of Mark by a person. We've heard the demons make that confession. And Matthew says it like this in Matthew 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They got it right. Verse 30 says, And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Teresa, what have the disciples been thinking these last two and a half years as they've been following him? Why has it taken them so long to come to the confession, you are the Son of God, the Christ? Now, don't be too hard on them. Because as they've been following him, they've been mostly convinced all along. I mean, they've stayed with him when others have fallen away. But they have struggled. They've struggled. And I'll tell you why they struggle. It's not because he doesn't have divine power. They struggle because 
They have all of these preconceived ideas, like I just told you, of what their Messiah would look like and what he would do. It was obvious to them he was from God. He just didn't do what they thought he would do. Where was the conquest? Uh, where was our national independence? Why hasn't he overthrown Rome? Oh, we hate Rome. Where's the power? Where's the blessing? Jesus was so humble. Jesus was so submissive. Jesus even paid taxes to Rome. He was hated by the religious leaders of Israel. Even John the Baptist got confused. And he was the very forerunner of Jesus. He sent his disciples, as we saw in our homework. He sent his disciples as he's in prison. Go ask him whether he is the Messiah or should we look for someone else. I mean, Jesus didn't fit their picture. It didn't look the way they thought it should look. But here the disciples are at a now settled conclusion. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of James. That's his name. That's Peter's name. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So let's write this on our handout. This revelation of who Jesus is has come to them from God himself. You are the Christ. You are the King. You are the promised one. You're the one we're waiting for. You're the one who has come as prophet, priest, and king to reign and to rule. This is the moment when the disciples settle the matter of the person of Jesus. This is the moment when they believe, when they are convinced, and they confess as to who his person is. Every good Jew who knew the Old Testament well was looking for the Messiah. They anticipated his coming for centuries. And the Old Testament is full of promises that are attached to his coming. Promises of salvation, an earthly kingdom, blessing, prosperity, reconfiguration <laughs> of the earth, Israel being elevated among every nation, God, Jesus himself ruling from Jerusalem, joy, peace, blessing. This is what they were waiting for. And the disciples, I mean, this is what they thought too. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the King. And then Jesus is just going to speak very plainly. Is what we're going to do. Not a parable. Just very plainly. I feel so sad for the disciples right here. They have so much to learn. And Jesus tells them, now don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. He strictly charged them, don't tell anyone. Teresa, why? Why? You know who he is, why not tell anyone? Let's write down why. Because that's not the full message. That's not the full message. It's not the whole story. It's missing a part. What is it missing? Write it down. It's missing the gospel. And that brings us to verse 31. There is such a high point, such a grand confession. Peter, God has shown you this. Blessed are you. Oh, Peter's feeling so good about himself. And then verse 31, and Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. What a blow. By the way, notice that phrase in verse 31. Don't miss this phrase. And he began to teach them. This message is about to become the theme of his instruction to the disciples. They do not want to hear this. 
They cannot even process this. This is the worst news imaginable. They're completely unable to comprehend what he said. They have no more questions with who he is. That's settled. But they have a huge problem with the plan. So write that on your hands. And they're struggling. They're struggling. And look what happens in verse 22, 32. Peter gets Jesus. He takes him aside and he began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And Peter goes from being the hero to going to a very low place, even being addressed by Jesus as Satan. I really want to cry for Peter. He's become fallen from being the spokesman for God to now being the spokesman for Satan. And they just they're trying to wrap their heads around two colliding revelations. Revelation number one, Jesus is Messiah. This one whose life is going to bring salvation and blessing to Israel and to the whole world. And yet, Revelation number two, how can it be that he will be killed by the people of Israel and the world? They've been knocked off the top of the mountain. They're learning. They're learning. Now write this down. Their view of the Messianic kingdom was wrong. They had the wrong view. And they had to learn that before a crown would come, a cross would come. There was going to be pain first. And they had to learn this suffering before glory. And they didn't have any room in what they believed in their theology for the cross, for the death of Jesus. And so Jesus tells them plainly, listen, I'm going to die. And not only that, you're going to die too. Wow. That's good news, isn't it? And so here comes Jesus' invitation. Now, I know you're tired and we've been going and we're almost done. But this is really the best part of our lesson. I hope you're not too tired that you're going to miss this part. So listen carefully. What exactly is it going to look like for us to follow him? This is a gospel, part of the gospel that I don't think is communicated very effectively in, in the United States. Look at verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You're the Christ. By the way, I'm going to die. It's not as you think it's going to be. And by the way, if you follow me, first of all, you're going to have to deny yourself. So put that on your hand. Anyone who comes to Christ, you want to come to Christ, this is where you start. It starts when you deny yourself. And what you're actually saying in that word deny is this. It's very interesting in the Greek. It means this. I no longer want to associate with the person that I am. That's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? It means to disown. I'm going to disown myself. I'm going to abandon my own ambitions, my own agenda, my own plans. All my own works. I can't earn this salvation. I realize I'm a sinful person. This is where new life in Jesus is begins. I've got to realize, I, I've got to give up my independence. I can't trust in myself anymore. I came to Christ 
I come to him and I'm depending on him alone and I'm humbling myself before him. It means you're spiritually bankrupt with nothing whatsoever to offer him. Coming humbly to him with no other place to turn. Seeing him, uh, the fact that he is Lord, he's Lord, and I'm coming bowing before him. This is the starting place. This is the foundation of salvation. Now go back to verse 34. There's something else to point out. If anyone would come after me, where do you start? You deny yourself. And then this, you take up your cross. That involves cross-bearing. What does that mean, Teresa? And you keep in mind, they don't know yet Jesus is going to die on the cross. He's not talking to them about his death. He's talking to them about their death. You're going to have to bear a cross. And their, the mind that would picture that would come in their mind immediately would be a crucifixion. There were over, uh, let me see, I put a number down here. I think it was like probably something like 70,000 Jews who were crucified during the time that Jesus was on the earth. They knew it was a cruel form of death and suffering. So what does it mean, Teresa? I'm going to deny myself. That doesn't sound like fun. I'm going to take up my cross. Whew, that's death. What does it mean? I think I missed something here, but one thing I have circled is here. It means to be willing to pay any price because salvation is so valuable. You know, it's kind of like that parable of the pearl a great price. <clears throat> and that person wanted that so badly. What did they do? They sold everything in order to get that one thing. That's what it means. Does this offer of salvation have enough value to you that you would give up everything for it? Our generation, people really think about it. They lay down their lives all the time. People die for their country. People die for causes. And Jesus is saying, will you lay down your life for me? That's what it means to be saved. And then a third thing. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And number three, follow me. What does that mean? Let's write it this way. It means to imitate Jesus. It means to live a life marked by obedience. It means that you aren't just a hearer of the word, but you're a doer of the word. So, if anyone wants to come after me, disciples, crowd, listen up. You've got to say it by yourself. You've got to pick up a cross and then let's go. We're ready. Follow me. And then Jesus gives us a paradox. I love this in verse 35. 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will save it. Now here's the deal about life. If you, this is just such an odd thing. If you hang on to it, and you say, I'm in control of it, and you go say, I'm going to live it my way, and I'm going to just cherish my sin, and if I do that, I can save my life temporarily, but if I will give it up and lose it for the sake of Christ, and the gospel's sake, I'm going to find it. <coughs> Such an oxymoron. And then, a question is posed. Look at verse 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Did that man make a good deal? Did that man find a bargain? Verse 37. For what can a man give in return for his soul? 
I mean, if you lose your soul, how can you ever buy it back? I mean, even if you had all the money, all the resources in the whole world, it wouldn't be enough to give it in exchange for your soul. Now let's flip that though, and let's write it this way. Your soul is worth more than anything or everything in this world. And I'll tell you why. It's because this world is going to burn up. Everything in it is going to burn up. And you will live forever in your soul. There's no price for your soul except one price that's been paid by Jesus. That's the only provision that has been made. And it's a gift of salvation that's offered to us. It is of infinite value. So we saw the invitation. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me. We saw the paradox. It's winning by losing. That's a crazy thought. And then comes the last verse, and it's a warning. Look at it. Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So Jesus is giving a strong invitation, but notice it's followed by a severe judgment. And it's a hard invitation. It requires total abandonment. It requires cross-bearing, obedience, giving up your life to save it. But if you choose not to do it, and you hang on to your own life, and you're ashamed of Christ, ashamed to identify with him and fully embrace him, in the middle of this adulterous and sinful generation, if that is where you would rather be, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of you. When he comes at his coming in the glory of his Father with all of his holy angels, and then you will take your place along with the perishing world and all the other gospel rejectors, and you will face divine judgment. Let's write it this way because this is what he's saying. His first coming, he comes to save. And then the warning is, in his second coming, he comes to judge. And this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that the second coming of Christ is mentioned. And what a note for us to end on. Judgment is coming. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. Now, go <laughs> But the question is simple. How valuable is your soul? Your soul will live forever. Your soul will live forever. Let's just read. Verse 1 of chapter 9 at the end of your handout. It really should have been included in our, in our lesson today. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those standing here right now who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And this is just a prophecy. Some standing here in this crowd not all of you, just some of you. But those some of you who see it, they're going to take the message to the others. It's very specific language here. They're going to get to see the kingdom of God coming with power. What in the world does that mean? I mean, it's just a staggering promise. And that's exactly what happens in chapter 9. So you've got to come back. We're going to study it together. Because beginning in verse 2 of chapter 9, Jesus is going to take three of his disciples up onto a mountain and be transfigured before them. And they are going to see the glorified risen Lord. And the kingdom of God is going to be shown to them in all its glory. 
But we'll have to wait until we come back after Christmas. Now, as we close, I'm going to say, please come back. Please come back in January. And feel free to invite others to join us. We have more workbooks in the office. Anybody you invite can just stop by and pick one up. And I want to tell you I appreciate your faithfulness to come to Bible study and, and to study together. Sometimes I just have to pinch myself because it's so wonderful to me to get to be a teacher of such a wonderful, beautiful group of women. I love you dearly. And I thank God for all we learned. I'm not going to be the same because I've studied this book. Ooh, not one time. And I hope that's your testimony as well. It's been a wonderful privilege for us to study it together. Now, I do hope you have a wonderful holiday. I'll be praying for you and you pray for me. Let's close with you. Praise the word, Lord. Thank you. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for for bringing us to where we are in our study. Thank you for just the beautiful life of our Lord. I feel so close to you because of following you in this book. Thank you for the truths and the, the beauty of his life, the power of his life. <coughs> Thank you for the knuckleheads of the disciples who actually got it and took the message to the world. And now we sit here this morning because of their faithfulness to deny themselves and to take up their cross and to follow Jesus. And Father, we're the only light in our generation. I pray that you will just take that invitation and let it land on our hearts this morning. And may we be so committed to it as we've never been committed before. Use us, Father, in our generation. We pray for our generation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll see you in January.